So, if Hasib Hussain was supposed to have been on that number 30 bus, registration LX03BUF, how would it be possible for him to get the exact bus that would get him to one of the four locations where the mock terrorist exercise would be taking place when that bus was diverted from its normal route to Tavistock Square unless he had been recruited to play the part of a mock terrorist and told exactly which bus to get, where and at what time by the people who organised the mock terrorism exercise and who knew the bus would be diverted to Tavistock Square. The odds against that happening by coincidence are unbelievable, and thus it is not possible that it was a coincidence. Another unbelievable coincidence is that all of the CCTV cameras at all four of the blast sites were not working that day. The four CCTV cameras on the number 30 bus were, just like the Israeli variant systems ones on the underground, not working, and there are no reliable witnesses who can place Hasib Hussain on the number 30 bus. Richard Jones is an unreliable witness whose physical descriptions of the man he says was the suicide bomber does not fit with Hasib Hussain's appearance or what he was wearing that day. So there is no proof that Hasib Hussain was either on that bus or blew it up. Even so, he has been tried and wrongfully found guilty of blowing up the number 30 bus by the government organised and controlled media machine without a shred of real evidence. They claim to have found Hasib Hussain's ID in Tavistock Square. However, they also claim that ID from another of the four, Muhammad Siddiqui Khan, was found in at least two, some reports say three, separate blast locations. He cannot possibly have been in two or all three locations at the same time, proving that these items were planted after the blasts. How could their IDs have survived suicide bomb blasts? Millions of people are aware of the magic fireproof Mohammed Atta passport that was planted at the World Trade Center on 9-11. In light of these incidents, if ID from Hasib Hussein was found at Tavistock Square, it does not necessarily mean that he was on the bus and not somewhere else. Or, if he was on the bus, that he blew the bus up. What has happened to the presumption of innocence and being considered innocent until proven guilty and convicted by a jury of your peers in court that has always been the mainstay of British justice? The most likely case is that the number 30 bus had been pre-rigged with explosives during its previous service when the CCTV cameras were disabled. The CCTV systems on stagecoach buses are normally either the Israeli company variant systems RP12001 or Timespace X200. A witness, Richmal Marie Oates Whitehead, age 35, who worked at the BMA in Tavistock Square and was hailed as a heroine for her actions during the London bombings, said she heard two explosions on the bus. The controlled media immediately went on the offensive and did a character assassination of the heroine because her testimony did not fit with the official story and she died unexpectedly shortly afterwards. However, other witnesses also reported a second explosion on the bus. Richmal's and other witnesses' testimonies would account for pre-planted explosives and a bomb being planted later on 7-7-2005. What we can be certain about, though, is that, either on the bus or elsewhere, Hasib Hussain, like the other three Muslim patsies, was murdered. 
Seventh chapter title, Pre-Planted Explosives Witnesses of the tube train explosions state that there were no Muslims with backpacks and no backpacks or bags left unattended on the trains in the carriages that blew up and the floors of the trains blew upwards from underneath, not downwards, as would be the case with explosives inside the trains. Explosives under the train floors, powerful enough to rupture the carriage floors and bend them upwards, would also lift the carriages up off the rails and derail them, as did happen. Those explosives were not homemade but military grade high explosives that would not be available to Muslim suicide bombers. The official story was that they used homemade explosives which has later been proven to be a lie. So we know from reliable eyewitnesses who can be traced that there were no backpack homemade bombs or Muslim bombers inside the tube train carriages that blew up and that the floors blew upwards so the bombs which were made from military grade explosives must have been fastened underneath the floors of the train carriages. Only people having access to the tube trains during the times that the trains were not running would be able to plant those bombs under the train floors. Benjamin Netanyahu, the Israeli finance minister, said that he was warned by Scotland Yard not to leave his hotel room on the morning of 7-7-2005 before the first explosion was reported implying that they had foreknowledge of the plan. Scotland Yard then quickly denied being the ones who had provided the warning, but have not told us who did warn Netanyahu if they did not. Why was Benjamin Netanyahu warned, but not the British people who pay their wages and whom they are paid to protect? Was it because it would have spoiled their evil plan to murder British people to change the nation's mind about British troops fighting in the Middle East. Two weeks later, the head of the Israeli Mossad, General Meir Dagan, said that he had warned Benjamin Netanyahu at 08.40 a.m. on 7-7-2005, ten minutes before the first blast occurred. How did he know what was going to happen in London if Scotland Yard did not warn him. Did he wait to warn Benjamin Netanyahu until it was too late to warn the British people so as not to spoil their evil plan? Was the London bombing a covert MI5 operation or an Israeli Mossad operation or a joint operation by both of them? The British people have the right to know.